An atom of any given element can absorb light at specific wavelengths and emit light at those same wavelengths too. This concept can be seen here in comparing the absorption and emission spectra of hydrogen, where we can see the placement of the emission lines match the locations of the absorption bands. We can also see this happening here in the absorption and emission spectra of helium. But how does a single atom actually create light? In order to answer this question, we have to revisit the structure of the atom. Atoms are the extremely small building blocks of matter, having a nucleus of protons and neutrons at the center, orbited by a cloud of electrons. The electrons are negatively charged particles, protons are positively charged, and neutrons are, well, neutral. Let's look at a simplified diagram of an atom. This is nitrogen. It can be found here on the periodic table of elements. If we look closely, we can see that the atomic number of nitrogen is 7, which means that it has 7 protons in its nucleus. In neutral hydrogen, there are also 7 neutrons in the nucleus as well. But what we really want to focus on are the electrons of the atom. These electrons are not all found in a perfect circle around the nucleus. Instead, they occupy different energy levels, meaning some are located on orbitals that are closer to the nucleus, while others are located further away. Here, there are two electrons occupying the innermost energy level, but the remaining five are further split into two separate energy levels, with two of those five remaining electrons occupying the inner energy level, and the remaining three occupying the outermost energy level. But what if we looked at an even simpler atomic model, one that had, say, only one proton and one electron? This would be an atom of the element hydrogen, which can be found here on the periodic table. In fact, about 80% of the entire universe is hydrogen, so we'll definitely be talking about hydrogen a lot in this class. In the case of the hydrogen atom, the single electron has options. It can be located in any of the energy levels around the hydrogen nucleus. If we were to take a closer look at this cutaway, we would see this type of spacing between the various energy levels of hydrogen. The n equals 1 state, which is also referred to as the ground state, is the state that you're most likely to find hydrogen's only electron. The probabilities of the electron being found in any of the excited states decreases with each jump further away from the nucleus of the atom. We refer to these higher energy levels above the ground state as the excited states. But what happens when electrons move from shell to shell in an atom? On one hand, the electron can drop down in an energy level, emitting a photon in the process. But on the other hand, the electron can also absorb an incoming photon and it will jump to a higher energy level as a result. These sorts of jumps between the various shells in an atom are called electron transitions. The atom emits a photon of light if its electron jumps down towards the nucleus. Similarly, incoming photons are absorbed by the atom when electrons transition away from the nucleus, jumping from a lower energy level to a higher one. One way to remember which action is associated with which electron transition is to remember these two pairs of words. Emit towards and absorb away. When electrons jump from one energy level to another, the greater the jump, the more energy is associated with that jump. The photon involved in that transition will also have a higher energy than a photon involved in a smaller transition. In fact, we can actually calculate the exact amount of energy of each of these photons that are either emitted or absorbed, since the energy values of each of these orbitals are actually known. Knowing this energy, we can then determine the wavelength of the photons by using E equals hc over lambda. So let's review. Which of these transitions, A or B, is associated with the absorption of a photon? Assume level 1 is the ground state. The answer is B, since we're looking for the arrow that is pointing away from the ground state, away from the nucleus. Now, which of these transitions, labeled A through D, has the photons of the shortest possible wavelength? Remember, the bigger the jump, the more energy is associated with that jump, and the more energy there is, the shorter the wavelength of that photon. So, our answer here is B. Now, what about the transition that has the photons of the longest wavelength instead? Here we look for a transition that's as small as possible, since the smaller the jump, the lower the amount of energy associated with it. And the lower the energy, the longer the wavelength of that photon. 
So here, the answer is C. Now this is the complete energy level diagram of hydrogen. It represents the possible transitions that an electron in the hydrogen atom can undergo. The size of the arrows determines the jumps that the electron makes, and the bigger the jump, the more energy is associated with that transition. The direction of the arrows determines whether a photon will be emitted or absorbed in that transition. A free electron is one that has escaped from the atom, and it is said to have zero energy. So if an electron is in any one of the bound states, meaning any of the states below the highest possible energy level, it needs a certain amount of energy to be lifted out of that bound state. This is why photons are absorbed when electrons transition away from the nucleus, since incoming photons bring in that necessary energy for such a transition to take place. So if we say that the free electron has zero energy, then a bound electron must absorb specific amounts of energy in order to be free. These amounts are determined by the spacing of the energy levels and can be seen both as positive energy values or negative energy values. The only reason why you may see them listed as negative values is as an implication that it must absorb that same amount of positive energy from an incoming photon so that it can escape the atom from that particular bound state. Those closest to the nucleus require more energy to be absorbed for the electron to escape than those that are further away. But there are transitions that take place within the various energy levels as well, and it is possible for the electron to be transitioning from one bound state to another bound state. These transitions are grouped into three categories. The Lyman series, where electrons transition between the ground state and the first four excited states. The Balmer series, where electrons transition between the first excited state and the four excited states above it. And the Passion series, where electrons transition between the second excited state and the four excited states above it. Photons emitted or absorbed in the Lyman transitions will have ultraviolet wavelengths, since these transitions are quite large, requiring a lot of energy. Photons emitted or absorbed in the Passion series will have infrared wavelengths, since these transitions are quite small, requiring significantly less energy than either the Lyman or Balmer series. The Balmer series, however, are extremely important since these are the transitions associated with visible photons of light. So when we look at the familiar emission spectrum of hydrogen, it's actually the Balmer series that we're looking at. Now, each of these colors in the Balmer series is the result of a specific transition. The H-alpha line is caused by the electron transitioning from the third energy level to the second energy level. H-beta is the result of the electron transitioning from the fourth to the second energy level. And H-gamma and H-delta are formed by the electron transitioning from even higher levels to the second energy level, which we also call the first excited state. But if we look at even heavier elements like helium or lithium, we'll see that each of these two elements have slightly more complex energy level diagrams since these are more complex atoms. Introducing just one additional electron in helium definitely allows for many more electron transition possibilities. So in the helium energy level diagram, we can see the possible electron transitions as the vertical lines drawn between the orbitals that are labeled 1s or 2p, 3d, 4f, among many others. The possibilities here are vastly more for the electrons in helium. The energies necessary for electron transitions in helium are given on the vertical axis on the left, this symbol implying a cut and stitch of the values in the axis so that it can be situated into a graph that fits the screen. For comparison, take a look at where the energies of hydrogen's energy levels fit on this scale to get a sense of the energies associated with helium's electron transitions. Now, the electron transitions in lithium are similar to those of helium, if not slightly more involved, considering there are now three electrons that are circling around the lithium nucleus in various energy states. For comparison, we can again look at the energy levels of hydrogen and see that the n equals 1 or ground state of hydrogen is well below the bottom edge of this image. If we continue through the rest of the elements of the periodic table, we'll come to see that every element has differently spaced orbitals, so the photons that are emitted from these electron transitions of each element will be in a pattern that is unique to that element. So each element's emission line spectrum is more or less the fingerprint of that element, with no two elements having the same exact set of emission lines. So if we were to look at the emission line spectrum of all of these elements, 
this is what we would see.